The Dark Room with your hosts, Paul Salvatore and Jordan Randall. Okay, so here we are. We're sitting down with Mindbender, who is a hip-hop artist, and now he's a porn star. star. And as far as I know, I mean, very recently, he's turned in uh, into a porn star, or he has moved into porn. So for the most part, I know Mindbender as a lot of other people know him as a hip-hop artist, as a hip-hop aficionado. So um, I'm really eager to know what accounts for the change and what life is for uh, is like for him right now. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So mine better. Um, you know, I was asking before, like, how a documentary isn't uh, done on you yet. Uh, how is that possible? I mean, you've been into so many things for so long. You've been, especially with hip hop. I I feel you, man. I agree. Like, half of me wants to just make my own documentary myself, but it might be slightly, slightly not as subjective as a documentary needs to be. <laughs> yeah. Or objective, I mean. Um, <laughs> a couple cats have talked about doing a documentary on me. Um, uh, Cashmere uh, talked about it once. Uh, who works with RT um, and John Natalin and stuff. A uh, couple couple cats in Toronto have been like, I mean, um, even Che Kotari, once we were hanging out once, and he's like, yo, somebody needs to interview you right when I started my porn career. A um, couple cats have thrown the idea out there because they know that it's an awesome idea. But it's also daunting because I got maybe 25 years of history in maybe five different industries in this city. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So uh, it would be an amazing story, and I hope it gets done so I can see it before I die. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, uh, a, a director with huge genitalia needs to, <laughs> needs to take on that task if they want to do it half decently. Right, right. So, like, you've been in it for how many years exactly the game? Uh, well, it's weird. Um, you know, probably over 20 years. Um, I'm 38 now. Right. And, uh, yeah, I moved to Toronto when I was, like, well, I've been coming to Toronto since I was 14 or 15, but I was born here, did high school in Ottawa, and came here for music college when I was 20 or 19. 19, So, So like, being in the hip-hop scene, though, you were full-on, though, right? Were you going to every single show? (laughs) Yeah. Because that's the impression I get when I, like, uh, when I read and hear about what you were up to you know during those years i'm I'm actually a different guy now and i'm exploring certain different things but i actually could say uh almost every show that happened for maybe a decade and a half in toronto every major historic legendary show for almost every artist that mattered in hip-hop culture that happened in toronto pretty much pretty sure i could say i was there I like there was I, I'm at the point where it's really hard to mem- remember now. like for instance I was just thinking about OC and I was like I don't know if I I, I did see OC yeah that's right you played it at DITC show but like I have to filter through my memories wow. to be like did I see that guy when did I see them and but like De La Soul you bring up De La Soul and I'm like I've seen De La Soul 12 times and there's wow. multiple different concerts I've seen The Roots officially 20 times now I've seen method man like eight times i like it's it's like oh okay well you want to talk about red man well which venue do you want to talk about it which tour which which whatever so like there's layers and layers and layers of history um j electronica came and uh janelle monet was also playing and i remember that night was a special night because i officially went to five different venues and we we there's a documentation of it somewhere online but i was like yo i'm it was a CMW week, and um, I was just with somebody, and we just we were all over the city. We went to the Royal York to see um, to see Janelle Monae, and then we ended up rushing to the Phoenix to see J Electronica. But before that, we were on Queen Street. We were seeing some locals, and like I was just like, I've been to five venues this one night. It's a pretty good day in my Bender history book. 
That's quite the yeah. accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. Did you go to all these shows uh, as, as purely a fan, or was it sort of like an educational process to try and pick up as much as you can from live performances, soak it in like a sponge? It's everything. I am I am a renaissance man in the culture. Um, I'm a fan, but I don't, like to reduce me to a fan is is a disservice to everything else that I've given and done. Um, I love Blog To for calling me Toronto's biggest hip hop fan, and it's true. I don't want to say it's true, but I guess it's kind of got some truth to it i don't want to like i'm sure there's cats with some bigger collections than me and maybe more something than me or another but like i'm just one dude in toronto that's very dedicated and do you I, collect do you collect vinyl or um well i don't have much room for vinyl anymore right. i have some vinyl i have all my cassettes i have thousands and thousands and thousands of magazines um most of canadian most canadian hip hop history i have original copies of most of the magazines that ever were printed here back when magazines were still printed yeah and um i got to, um, you know thousands of cds and stuff but um there's somebody with a bigger collection but as far as seeing concerts and going and writing reviews and like being a f- hip-hop fanatic um i i don't want to seem arrogant but at the same time i can say that i haven't seen too many people as dedicated as i am so like yeah so you're definitely up there. I'm up there. Up there with I'm up there with the, the top than that. It's almost like, like a religion. It very much is a religion. <laughs> so, no, a million percent it is a religion. Right. But essentially it's all the same thing. People are gathering in a room to hear a message. And you're right. If somebody's delivering a message and everyone is devoutly enraptured by it. Absolutely. I mean, did you feel like you were searching for something along those lines when you were going to so many shows? I wasn't really not really searching for some not that's a good question i mean i was always getting what i wanted i was you know what actually uh what i was searching for was the truth of the artist because um i was always like i was ahead i got to see all of the 90s i my favorite era in hip-hop and i mean i loved them all i was a, a kid for the 80s but i was you know I saw, like, I've been a fan of LL Cool J and Run DMC since 82, 83. And, like, I saw LL Cool J finally when he opened up for Janet Jackson in, like, 2006. So it took me, like, 15 years to see LL Cool J. But, um, <clears throat> and when I saw him, I was like, I wanted to parallel if he's as good of a performer and vocalist and, like, if he had the clever, witty stage banner. And if he was a re- the real superstar that I had always imagined as I was a kid in 1985, I wanted to see if in 2006 or whatever he was still, like, that person and then some. And Ella was cool. Like, he was – I mean, I've never met him, but – um. Um, first, when I go to shows, I always wanted to see the artists and see if they could perform the music the same way I dreamed it and the way I loved it. And then I always usually wanted to just have a one moment of truth with them, shake their hand, look them in the eye and just have a real person to person moment with them and be like, yo, my name is Mindbender. Thank you for your music. You've changed my life. And then just see if they're like cool with it or uncool with it. Cause, um, I'll... (laughs) I love this story. Black Thought taught me so much. <laughs> I was a 14-year-old kid. I created my first cassette. Um, it was First Grade Pyramid, 1996. And Black Thought, had uh, he was performing with The Roots and um, Raskas and Socrates, if uh-huh. I remember properly, at the Opera House. And we go... I'm a young, wild, bright-eyed kid. I'm like, oh my god, I got my cassette. I got. I'm in a concert. Maybe if I give it to the right person, I'll get signed, and I'm gone. And like, so I see Black Thought. He's in this fur coat. Like, he, they just murdered the stage. It was a great show, and like, he's wearing this like diamond pendant, and like, he was like Black Thought. It was like, yo, damn, this guy's flossing still. He's a superstar, even though he was like uh, head rapper of the Roots. So I walk up to him. And I handed my cassette, and I was like, yo, what's up? Great show. Nice to meet you. My name's Mindbender. Here's my tape. I hand it to him. He takes the tape out of my hand, looks at it, and then just turns his head like I never even existed. And, like, and just floated away. And, like, to, honestly, I was like, I had never been disrespected on that level of, of not acknowledging another human right. being ever in my life. Oh, like yeah. I like as like 
friends and family never like a teacher in school like my enemies never did that to me never <laughs> brushed so me weird. off so i was like i was standing there a 14 year old kid and my heart just shattered i'm like oh my god he didn't he didn't he didn't say i'll listen to it or didn't say thanks he didn't say peace he literally took it out of my hand and wow and i was like wow Rappers yeah. can do that. Wow, that can happen in the wow. And so, and so that was, do you think it's because you were going after the art? Were you talking to a lot of people, like trying to always integrate yourself in the community? Uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I was never doing anything insincere. Like I would never, I would never force a picture, or I would never. Even when like there was a moment when Joe Budden and Raekwon had some beef. And, like, one of Raekwon's associates punched Joe Budden in the eye. And then, like, three days later, Raekwon had a show here at Sound Academy. Mm -hmm. And, like, it was, like, the first public appearance of Raekwon. So everyone was like, yo, 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 Raekwon, yo, Joe Budden got punched in the eye, yo, yo. Everyone's all hype about it or whatever. And I'm like, when I get him, I had a moment to talk to Raekwon. I'm like, that's not the first thing. I'm I'm not going to be like, yo. Give me an exclusive about your boy punching Joe Budden in the face. I'm like, All right. I'm like, I want to talk to you about life and how yeah, are you doing? And yeah. I hope you're good, Raekwon. Like, welcome back to this was before he ended up moving here. And I was like, right. welcome back to Toronto. We love you here. We appreciate you here. And and in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, I know there's all this media hype. And I'm talking to a guy who's got a lot of controversial energy around him right now. But like, I'm not just going to like get in a little cheat moment and be like, Give me a sound clip about like what what it was like to see Joe Budden get punched in the face. <laughs> well, yeah, that's when people do that. It is super insincere because they're doing that to get the story right, so mm -hmm. they can tell. So oh, I got the inside information. Whereas it sounds to me like you're looking way past that. You're looking for what makes this person that person. It's yeah, not. Yeah, not, I'm gonna get the story and tell everyone, and I'll get all the glory. Right? That's probably those people aren't even fans that are they're going up and asking that. Right? That's it. You know, just kind of media vultures, culture vultures, yeah. and just like. Yo, I'm like, I want to, like, literally all these rappers, I see them and I'm like, yo, are you good? Like, I just want to know if you're all right, because I know some hip-hop dudes, hip-hop fucked them up, and then, you yeah. know. I could imagine that's so refreshing, because a lot of people are taking that journalist approach, you know, trying to pigeonhole them as, you know, this, you know, you're this, that. It's so frustrating, but then if you have someone who's just approaching you as a person, asking how you are as you would just ask a friend i think that goes a long way thanks man yeah man. um before we get into the porn uh, I, just, yeah, uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you um i mean since you're so seasoned in the scene and you've been um going to the shows for so long how have you seen um the the culture change oh, i'm so glad you asked that man. yeah um you know i have to admit especially that since you brought up um part of my porn career um mm -hmm. i kind of i actually give a f can i swear oh yeah yeah okay. <laughs> I, 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 I give a mother flying fucking sucking cock cunting <laughs> fuck i've never cared less about hip-hop yeah. than i do right wow. now in this very moment yeah in my entire life in my 38 years like i'm still a tech i'm still attached and connected to the culture i'm still educated by it i'm still inspired and informed by it but like, um, I mean, I used to live, breathe, shit, and eat everything about music, read like everything. Yeah. But like now, I don't. Hip hop doesn't feed me the way it used to. Um, the MCs don't. The DJs, the music, the the fans, the the way that the industry respects the art form. Like any of us that lived through the '90s and yeah. some of the 2000s years who got to see hip hop in those days. We saw something special that the world will never experience again. It's like the difference between Woodstock '99 and Woodstock '67. <laughs> like it's right. the, like there is no there's no parallel. And I I I have nothing. I'm glad hip hop's still alive. I'm glad that there's a new generation of kids that have technology and they make beats and they write rhymes and put them together and make music to put it out there. I'm not too sure I call it hip hop culture because. I like KRS One's definition of hip hip hop, where it's like hip is being conscious and slick and smart in the mind and witty and clever and aware 
and then hop is movement and right. motion and so it's like hip hop culture is literally conscious movement like like yeah. psychological evolution of society and community and like i don't get that out of a lot of new music i'm like y'all i don't feel like you care about your city much you don't care about the culture much you don't care about the fucking tradition much you don't care about the history much for a lot of the rappers who've debuted in the last five years so like i'm aware of some of their names like i you know i'm, I'm more of like saying fuck Ty Dolla Sign you know I'm glad you rap I'd rather you rap than sell crack mm. but like I'm not checking your music the way I used to check for Latirix or Company Flow right. or or you know fucking everybody at Project Bloat or Big L or fucking yeah. Cameron even like like some hardcore East Coast rappers or people who used to spit because they liked rhyming and like being clever so like I have seen hip hop grow and I've seen like the golden era and like the, the new golden era and the old golden era. Like if you want to say the old golden era was like 88 or 85 to 90. And then the nineties were a different golden era. Like I got to experience both. And I just, I see people who are in their thirties and forties and stuff. I'm like, these kids nowadays will never know what they missed. <laughs> sure, you have the convenience of a, of, a, of a piece of technology that can give you music faster and more conveniently than ever before. Sure. But what we had to do when we all had to go down to Play D to get a record right, and right. we had to go and be there at 7 p.m. Yeah. or 8 p.m. on a Thursday because right, if you right. went late, then, right. you, then you didn't get Nas's new 12-inch if, right. if you went on Friday afternoon because it was all sold out on Thursday. So then you'd either have to listen to Power Move on Saturday between 2 and 4 right. to see if DJX played the song right. or get it from your friend who would have to give it to you off a dubbed copy of a cassette. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and if you didn't do that, you didn't have the music. You couldn't oh, yeah. get it for free. You couldn't get it from anywhere. No, you know, yeah, yeah. So, I remember reading. It, what was it? Decisive was saying that he would stop off at the variety store on the way home just to get the tapes ready for the next day for the Saturday for show. The Saturday show. Exactly. There was just a whole again, like I was saying before, there was a whole ritual. And when you're investing that much time, <laughs> never mind money, but that much time, like you're going to appreciate the end result more. You're going to cherish those tapes. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the, the community that we had right like we there is a community now of people sending and sharing files and whatever okay that happens right but those that community is not looking each other in their eyes oh, um, yeah. it's not like your homie or homegirl seeing you at school and being like here's a cassette of me taping master plan last night and you getting it out of their hand and be like thanks yo i got the new big pun song on here thank yo i yeah. fucking yeah. love you yo thanks for hooking me up and there's all connection physical hand culture of like real real oh, yeah. real just unity and like i don't want to say there's no unity nowadays but there is a, f a fragmentation yeah. and a segregation in the hip-hop culture that is unfathomable like people is mostly people sitting in their solitary units listening solitarily to their stuff either in their headphones or at home and right. be like i downloaded this and you just digitally send your friend the same link and like when do you listen to it together yeah that's right yeah it's very disconnected yeah. it's uh yeah and i guess like the the ease of that like it's just sort of created like an oversaturation so i and also the the digitalization of files you know like when you've had a cassette or a cd or something like that something about the tangibility of that medium you're handing that over and it's like oh this is actually a thing if you have a bunch of like files on your hard drive and you just see the names you're like yeah you know, I'll listen to this. It's all, it doesn't give you that uh, that same feel, right? You can't care about it, like mm -hmm. if it's not a like a physical copy. You really just can't. Mm -hmm. You're like, even if it's a classic album, I don't fucking classic albums barely get created anymore. But like, fuck, say you got Jay Z's The Blueprint, or fucking Reasonable Doubt. You got uh, like a bunch of files on a screen, or you have the physical copy in your hand, like. Yeah. I still have my cassette of Jay Z's Reasonable Doubt. Nice. Yeah. And like yeah, you guys said it, man. Um but uh I feel like that I don't I feel like there's more to say about the era. Did I answer your question about Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely I'm thinking too the artists I think took the whole process seriously. I think so, because they couldn't just pick up a mic at home and record the whole album. They knew they were going to that studio that day and they had to be ready. They had to, I'm thinking that they probably had rehearsed, they wrote the lyrics and rehearsed those lyrics so many times that by the time they went in the studio, 
it was just so second nature. And that's why, like, when you listen to Mob Deep and Wu-Tang, Big L, it's so on point. They're so tight, those rhymes. Mm -hmm. They're so... It's just everything is right. The lyrics, the flow, the delivery. I think a lot of time with, like, uh, mm -hmm. good artists, yeah. whether hip-hop or not, I mean, I think a lot of the time <clears throat> having challenges is something or struggles, even to the most minor degree, is something that's going to help the music forward. Now that's so easy, I think that, you know, people aren't putting in as much to it because they're like, well, you know, I can bang out a track in, like, you know, like five, five minutes, minutes, like, in front of my computer. So, you know, I'll if I make, like, 200 songs, then people will listen to them or I'll get my name out there. But all each of those individual songs have, like, little to zero, like, actual m meaning or any substance to them, right? Yeah, or replay value. And, yeah. And, like... Yeah. Like, um, I saw him perform and it was great, but like a little B for instance, like he banged out all those mixtapes and albums and whatever. And it's like, if they were the quality of little Wayne, when little Wayne was just gushing out songs, then you would probably be on little Wayne's level and little Wayne's mm -hmm. status of fame and respect as an MC. But it's like, I respect as far as like just simple productivity, like any artist that creates whatever, I, I'll respect that to the degree that, hey, you're putting in work. But as, I'm not going to be like, yo, little B, you're an MC that's like, you're not even a DMX, much less a fucking AC alone. Like, <laughs> like you're a very, you don't care about the culture of lyricism and you don't care about the traditions. You're just, you're just making music to make it like, mm -hmm. like Soldier Boy or whatever. You guys just bang yeah. out stuff and it's like well, you, you got yeah. a digital thing in your living room and you can just record, record, oh, record. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to make history that way. Yeah. You'll, you'll make one kind of a history, but not really music history. Yeah, it's quantity versus quality, right? Yeah. So I want to get into yeah, but, the board now. Yeah, let's go. Let's yeah, go. so, you know, when I saw you at the uh, the sex show, uh, I remember I came up to you and I asked you, one of the first questions I asked you was, like, how's the music going? And now in retrospect, I'm thinking, maybe I should have asked you, like, how's the porn going? <laughs> Like, I had no idea, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? So this is like a, a recent, like, um, I don't know if the right word is change or is like a, it's a, a recent decision to to enter. Yeah, um, it's funny. Um, my friend Tom Quinlan uh, from Han Solo Records, he, there was a compilation around the year 2000 called Cock Dynamics. And uh, a bunch of classic Canadians were on it. Um, Buck 65 was on uh -huh. it. Collapse Syllables, Fritz the Cat, Mocha Only, um, uh, Bird of Prey. And I was on it too. Cool. And, and my friend uh, sent me the song that I put out. And Tom's like, do you remember when you did this song around the year 2000? And I was like, oh, I don't remember what song you did for the compilation. What was it? And the song was called fuck rap i want to be a porn star oh yeah so like this i was like oh shit i can't i have i can't i forgot i made that song oh yeah. that's jokes so like i mean i actually genuinely right. have had desires to do porn and get into sexuality for my entire life for sure but um yeah it's only been real for the last year and a half or so and uh <laughs> it's great what is, what is it like from the inside now like from yeah, the, yeah that's, scene that's the, the way in, to in, ask the question. That's, yeah. that's, a, that, that's it. You're either on the outside of it, dreaming to get in, that's right. or you're on yeah. the inside of it, because loving it's a, that you're it, in. It's a fashion. Uh, sorry, it's a fantasy machine, right? So, like, how is it like within and the real? It's it's yeah. it's great. It's great. I'm shooting tonight at Oasis Aqua wow. Lounge. I'm shooting two scenes actually. Um, I have some beautiful, beautiful. That's not a bad life. I'm going to talk about hip hop, then I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's my life now. That's like, this is why some motherfucker needs to wake up and do a documentary that's on what me. I mean, yeah, exactly. like no, I'm serious. That's like, not bad. Yeah, no, like yeah, I have an yeah. amazing life. Yeah. Like I honestly like so I read some of my rap superstars' lives. I read about their life, and I'm like. I want to be me. Like, Jay-Z, you got a lot of money, but you, unless Beyonce lets you fuck other women, like, you got one woman. Right, like, right. I'm with 10 lovers right <laughs> now. Like, I like my life better. Right, right. <laughs> so, like, um, it's fantastically amazing. Um, The only, I mean, the dark side and downside is just living in Toronto because the industry is so small. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm staying here because I want to be part of actually building the industry that doesn't exist here. And that I envision should exist and could exist because Canadians need to stop being so fucking conservative and hypocritical. 
Um, there's a huge sex industry here. There's a huge movie industry here. Why isn't there a porn industry? Sex movies. We should have it. It's fucking in the back of Now Magazine. There's four or five right. pages of classified ads. There is secret sex happening all over Toronto. Right. But people don't want to be open about it and be like, hey, I like sex and I'm not going to judge somebody for doing it for recreation or for business. In Montreal, sex is fucking everywhere. Nobody gives right. a fuck. Everyone's cool with it. Kids, I'm reading about Montreal, Quebec parents are like, yeah, I don't care if my son goes into the porn, a daughter goes into the porn industry as soon as they're 18. Like, it's cool. Wow. I, I went to the Montreal Fetish Weekend in September. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. Amazing. Way back, uh, way less fucking stress around sex. Everyone's just cool. And you just didn't feel the stigma in the air. In Toronto, like, I feel being sexual, like, alienates me from some people and ostracizes me from some other people. And then... It, it, it endears me to a few people and it's it's all fucked up here but i really want to be part of like being part of the solution so like how long has it been that you've been in it uh i started last march okay, okay. so it's been like a year and a half year and three quarters you know what i love that you mentioned in some of the interviews is the god this worshiper okay okay yeah <laughs> so is that like that is uh amazing you know because that to me could be like a way of almost branding yourself but in a good way that's kind of political too it's like i'm about the female pleasure <laughs> i am a million percent and the like you know because so much of porn is not it's about you know the guy right it's always the guy catering to the guy the guy's point of view guy 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 but, you know, when you say, gosh, it's now flipping the script, right? You, you you nailed it. And it's like there's this weird duality happening in porn. It's it's the only industry where – the only industry on the planet out of all fucking human service interactions, period, in everything, where this is the only industry where the female gender is paid more money than the male gender. And most porn is shot shooting from the chest down so you don't see the guy's face. And you see the woman's pussy, tits, ass, body, fucking everything. See the cum shot on her face. But everything is working towards the male cum shot. And, like, it's all about satisfying the man for the male pornographer, actor, for the male voyeur's viewing. Right. And it's like, but the woman's getting paid the most and she does the most, most of the work. So it's all... It's all fucked up on so many levels. I um not even not everyone can even have a conversation about the concept of goddess worship and seeing people as gods and goddesses or divine entities and seeing sexuality as something that is a sacred act. Like right. I, I don't even you know, I tell most people, yeah, I do porn, whatever, but I actually do goddess worship. I actually love women on a mind, body, soul level. Like it's not just the body. I have great personal relationships with all the women that i work with and i love their fucking brains i love their independence and their freedom and their philosophies around sexuality and artistry and and like it's very psychological but i don't get to always talk about it Uh, but it's in operation when we're fucking um it's my respect for her and her respect for me and um you know like it's definitely a lane in in porn that is totally under explored and under created under manifested like You know, we're coming, you know, it's kind of like 21st century feminism is stronger than ever. And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of big movies are centered on women and like, you know, women are as a as an idea and an energy form in the world is like are getting more powerful than ever and like expanding. But like women in sexuality is still in a very conservative, traditional, patriarchal place. So like... You know, there's most women still won't like initiate going to pick up dudes. Most women still have to be afraid when they walk down the street at night. Right. Like, where's there's still a lot of fucking old school bullshit. And I'm I'm just doing porn and hip hop and fucking activism and various modes of expression and existence and work to just try and change the world. So, like hip hop, hip hop, like porn is actually the extension of my hip hop. I don't. Yeah, because I think, I mean, something along the lines you said that um, the way that you would like women to be talked about in hip hop isn't happening. So porn is, uh, yeah, is just kind of the, or the way that you're doing porn is kind of the way that you're trying to introduce what you would like to see. Yep. Yeah. In 
hip hop's like what a forty five year old culture now, and I, I I can think of maybe honestly less than five MCs that have ever had not only songs but a, like a prevailing life philosophy that encourages the respect and equality and dignity of women and respect around sexuality like i mean i i love all these dudes i i love to say everyone can be criticized and everyone can be complimented everything and everyone so like i can diss all my favorite mcs and i i will mean what i fucking have to say about it like one eminem is one of the most problematic people in hip-hop because he and i put my hand on my heart and my balls because I believe this with all my heart that Eminem is a bisexual, homophobic, gay, in the closet, complicatedly confused individual, but also a brilliant, one of the greatest geniuses ever. But he's also, I believe with all my heart and soul, he's gay as fuck and bisexual as fuck. And hip hop is just hip hop culture is just not that's mature enough to have yeah. this conversation. Um, not all, I believe Eminem and Dre, I don't think they're together anymore, but I believe they've had a sexual relationship for many years. Wow. And if as there's tons of lyrics that are... So it's embedded in the lyrics. See. Tons of double entendres. And then they, it got to a point where they wouldn't even, they, they wouldn't even really be hiding it much. Um, I, I won't, I won't divert onto that too much because people know... <laughs> I could. I've got hours of examples, uh -huh. um, but it's, um, it's interesting though because in, I don't know if you saw that movie, the Seth Rogen James Franco the that, interview. They that have that, is, that moment, right? That's where, the cherry on yeah. my cake. I've been talking about it for years, years, yeah. literally years. I'm documented talking about. I believe Eminem's gay. I have no problem with gay people. I've done gay scenes in some of the movies I've shot, not porn movies, but I shot an independent movie where I played a bisexual lawyer and I fooled around with four guys. I'm not saying this to out Eminem and be some fucking, you know, drag him out the closet and be some fucking, fucking ho horrible homophobic person. I'm saying this because I believe it's a fact and I feel it's unfortunate that Eminem can't talk about his actual sexuality in this culture because it's so fucking mos ma <clears throat> masculine and macho and fucking hyper aggressive and the interview was the place where i was like yo this is eminem's fucking crowning moment because one people won't believe it's real yeah. but at the same time i'm like eminem is playing himself and yeah. they're referring to real songs in real reality even if seth rogan and james franco aren't playing themselves mm -hmm. i'm like the human beings are playing reality and like this is a it, it gets so blurry and complicated but i mean reverting back i mean t hip hop is still it's 45 years old barely can deal with any gay rappers barely can deal with any lesbian rappers barely can deal with trans um mickey blanco is finally out doing his thing mc light and queen latifah and queen pen and all, all these right. other women who have been fucking stuck in the closet forever and do and missy elliott women who are i fucking hand on my balls and my heart women who are lesbians or bisexuals who cannot express their actual sexuality because people are too ignorant to fucking deal with the truth like i love all these people i say these and i don't care if people listen to i've been saying this for years but most people hear me in these podcasts or whatever and they're like oh my god mindbender just said eminem is gay but he's not really disrespecting him he's actually kind of supporting him i'm not ready to even have that conversation so i'm gonna not talk about it but i'm like Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck your ignorance, yo. Like, eminent, like, yes, hip hop is that fucked up where I am saying, uh, Mindbender Supreme says, the godfather of gangster rap is fucking gay. Deal with it. And the fucking m biggest living selling record selling motherfucker in hip hop is also gay. Deal with it. Dre and Eminem. Cool. Fucking half of your ra fucking rappers are probably gay gay and if you can't deal with that fact you're really not understanding hip-hop or truth or fucking life in the western world and, and and you know there's so much going on um that's actually part of the reason why i got into porn mm -hmm. um but also to, just because i mean sorry to divert so much but this is like yeah, the only yeah. thing i do anything for right, right. um like ll cool j um and common with the light and uh, LL Cool J for most of the 80s, Common with The Light, Most Deaf with Miss Fat Booty, Talib Kweli with, you know, uh, four women and a couple. 
Like, there's a few examples of hip hop really respecting women on a possible goddess worship level, right. on a real dignified, you know, hip hop's like, oh, and God MC, God MC, Jay Z's fucking crack dealer, Jay Z's calling himself God MC, to KRS One or other conscious rappers being like, or Nas, I'm Godson, whatever. So it's like, yeah, why don't we fucking parallel and equalize this concept to the women being seen as goddesses? Mm -hmm. Very few MCs ever talk about women on that level. Most of them talk shit and like, there's been a few moments of rappers actually elevating women to the a sacred level, right? But it's not sustained, and it's not like long term. And and I'm saying all this to say, like, even with a dude like Most Def, I love Most Def to fucking death. He's got he's one of the greatest MCs, brilliant guy. But in real life, like, he's got four wives. I, I, last I heard, I mean, he keeps it really private, but he's got four wives, and a lot of people are like, yo, like, he's not really that good to some of them sometimes. Some some stories have come out about it, like, because Socrates, his wife now, used mm -hmm. to be with most of them, oh. Alana. Right. So I've met Alana and stuff, and she was on Much Music on uh, for a, a panel talking about how, like, she didn't really slander most deaf, but she was like, yeah, well, he, he wasn't the nicest guy and stuff. So it's like, we've got most deaf. At one point, the golden boy of hip hop, fucking the savior of Rockus, one of New York's best MCs ever. And like, yo, he's got great rhymes, great fucking consciousness, great freestyle flow, great voice. He's an original dude. Great. Yay, most deaf. Most deaf's awesome. But when it comes to him and women, yeah, misogynist or shitty or, or cheating or whatever. And like, so many fucking rappers are like, yeah, this guy's a dope MC. Big pun. Amazing MC. One of the best MCs ever. Beat the fuck out of his wife. Like, what the fuck is that? Buster Rhymes, one of the greatest fucking vocalists ever in fucking all of music. A vocal beast. Horrible to women. There's girls online talking about Buster Rhymes gave me syphilis. There's fucking... Yes, like in the skits on the album, sometimes it comes out too. Oh like, my you know, God. It's like... The it, worst. It, what's interesting? It's like, I don't know. It's just, it's... Uh... It's not a mind bender. It's a mind fuck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes, like in reggae too, like sometimes they do elevate them to that level of goddess, you know, like Yo. my empress, right? Empress. But yeah. then there's like they get on the dance track. It's like yummy yeah, one, yeah, four. But But the thing is, like, I don't know, like, whether they're worshiping because, like, uh, you know, they're on that rhythm and they're talking, like, w they're delivering it with such pain, right? Yeah, me what up with you, my buddy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's, like, it's so like so much pain is in there. It's like <laughs> so I don't know if that's worship anymore or if it's something else. You you nailed it though, yeah. man. It's the conf like it's yeah. the confusion that yeah. a lot of sexuality is in, and yeah. that's why I'm actually in porn. I'm like sexual. I, I I say this. I I repeat this over and over because I really believe it. Like sexuality and sexual rights are the civil rights of the 21st century. Right. Yes, I genuinely believe that across the whole planet, all point. religions, all yes. Anybody who'd be like, yo, I'm into balloons, dogs pissing, big tits, asses, hair, legs, whatever. Everybody should be able to be like, this is my sexual desire, and I'm looking for people who are also into the same thing. Nobody should be judging each other be like all right well hey there's the internet find your group of people you like being whipped you like fucking dressing up like sailor moon you like fucking like you like feet whatever right. like you like black women whatever like find what you're into and be positive about it and don't get all fucked up internally about your don't oppress your own self sexually and don't oppress others and Maybe you'll like not hate your job and not hate your friends and not hate your life because you can actually express your inner truth. Yeah. But you, you know what? Before I forget, this is what I wanted to ask uh, based on that. Um, what do you think the repercussions would be if, say, like the community, the hip hop community came around and did accept that? Uh, like, w how would things change? Is, do you think there's a fear about like how things would change? Well, it would be like. It would be maybe more like metal because like Rob Halford is out, right? Fucking mm -hmm. Judas Priest, like some of the, you know, fuck, it would be like rock. Fucking Freddie Mercury's out as motherfucker, like yeah. since the 70s. Like Elton John's been out since the 80s. I'm still standing. Like 82, Elton John comes out, fucking puts out a huge pop song. And like a couple of people are like, oh, Elton John's gay. Eh. But then the rest of the world's like, well, fine, fuck you. Don't listen to this phenomenal pianist and great yeah. singer and you be your fucking stupid homophobic self over there and don't listen to him. I seen Elton John last year. One of the best concerts I ever seen. I fucking love Elton John. Like, 
I love Dr. Dre. I will. I'm like, if I ever meet Dre, I don't know if I'll have the balls to say in his face, hey, Dre, I think you're gay, but I still love you. But, like, I will say that right here, and I mean it. I fucking think Dre is gay, and I still love him. It's not a fucking, it's like, hey, you're one of the best beat makers ever. Being gay, I don't know if that helped you make beats or not, but, like, I don't give a fuck that you're gay. But, right. like, I want to be able to be that honest with you. And you don't, I don't, I want to be real. Hip hop is, what it, What the fuck is keeping it real? Is not keeping it real being true to yourself? Yeah. Isn't that what hip hop's about? And it's like, is hip, is, is fucking Dr. Dre going to be the next, like, Rock Hudson? That fucking, that fucking famous porn or famous, um, soap opera star who like lived his whole life and all the women wanted to fuck him and then he's about to die and he's like yo i'm gay and i've been gay for 45 years and i have a gay husband and i've had to pretend i'm a heterosexual man for my job forever and it's like yo fucking tupac on two of his biggest records is talking about how when tupac's like yo these are this is the realest shit i ever wrote on that record he's saying fucking gay ass Dre. i'm like yo if a motherfucker saying this is the realest shit I ever wrote and it's talking about a dude is gay, I'm going to lean towards him probably being honest about it. And I just want to talk about it for the sake of really dealing with the truth and not the illusions or any ignorant, dumb little bullshit because people are immature and fucking just not able to just deal with facts. Yeah. So, like, I mean, I'm in porn. Like, in porn, I want to be, like, the realest motherfucker. I'd be like, yeah, I'm not gay, but I did let a guy suck my dick because I actually was curious about the experience. I And I really went that far. Like, I and I came to found out that I was not attracted to men. But I've actually had my dick sucked by a guy because I'm like, yo, I'm a sexual explorer. I'm a sexual adventurer. I'm a sexual educator. I am actually willing to put my body in places for the sake of my own understanding of sexuality. I love pussy. I've had a scene with a trans woman. I've had, like, I'm doing these things because this is my life. I want to write songs about it. I'm a creative artist. I'm a creative being. I don't have fear around what I would say in a rap or where I would go to fucking fight for activism or who I would have sex with. Like, I'm willing to do these things that's what mind yeah. is so yeah so in terms of lines that you're not willing to cross um what do you what do you think about all this rosebud rosebud stuff um well i like to know about stuff um there's stuff that i'll read about i would like to read about as much as i can um as far as watching certain videos like eh, i'd rather read it in word to know what is being done like i to this day i've still never seen Two girls, one cup. Oh, yeah, oh, probably man. for the best. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. It's one of those irreversible things. Yeah, you know, that's it. Like, yeah. Sort of fundamentally changes who you are. It's so. like a nice piano. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very misleading intro. Yes. Yeah. Oh no! You see, that's the thing. All I know is people's reactions. I saw right. the reaction yeah, videos, and I know like right. the mythology right. around it. Yeah. I, I've never actually seen it, and I'm probably gonna keep it like that. <laughs> In my personal opinion, I think you should. Yeah, yeah, and that, it's, see, that, it's ruined me as a person. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it like i don't but want you know what's hilarious about some of these things that the seed of that idea was in someone's imagination and it just grew and grew until they thought this has to be produced you know and shared with the world and what's even better is that he probably didn't do it alone he convinced somebody yeah, else like this became was like, like a this project is a great idea. this became a project <laughs> He was hunting people. To just, exactly. You got a team. Like, hey, you know what? I guess you're right. That, it does sound like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and see, that's the thing. I like to know about these things, mm-hmm. but there are certain things that I won't watch myself. Yeah. Like, but when you're doing porn, like, is it, you know very much what you're going into. Like, it's not like somebody springs something up, like, on, on the day or something. Like never. That, right? Never. That's never happened. Like, that's another reason why I want to stay in Toronto. Because, like, if I were to move to Cali or Miami... I would be the fucking microscopic fish in a, in, in an ocean. So like I would I would have no autonomy. Well, I'd have very little autonomy, and I I would have to be at the mercy of a lot of the structures and traditions that are already existing there. Like nobody goes to Hollywood. The best actor in the world can't go to Hollywood and then revolutionize the place. There's motherfuckers, there's there's way things work around here. You you know you got to fall in line. So like I can't even that even though like I love eating pussy and I talk about goddess worship and I want to revolutionize human interactions and relationships and the connection between men and women and even want to make all this hip hop that's all positive and 
full of like woman respect and support like i can't go to los angeles and be like hey i got these great ideas and i got this dream and i'm all happy and i've got a pretty good dick and a pretty good body and let's change everything people be like motherfucker fuck you <laughs> like we'll see we still got all these videos that are traditional nut busting and pouring 40 ounces on girls and ass slapping and crazy freaky fucking hardcore shit that's what sells that's what we're doing and we might consider your idea possibly maybe in three months or something so like i mean i'm here because i can do goddess worship and tr like try and spread my positive approach to women here um and maybe go to montreal shoot a little i want to go to la and miami and amsterdam for like a three week stint maybe a month maybe if i go to amsterdam and be like oh my god i love it here i'll stay there for three months but yeah. then come back to you toronto know, I, I just had an idea you know where maybe the documentary whole thing could come in uh i was talking you know porn mike right yeah man that's yeah. a shot with him yeah and uh i saw his thing at the sex show and then i looked at his page and he has this whole thing about ethical porn yeah. So I'm like, you know, I'd like to interview you about this. You know, maybe we could do some filming. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, I would love to. <laughs> so I would... Just threw it in there. Yeah. So he's like, he's totally down. Right? He sounds like a great guy. I was telling Jordan on the way to pick you up. Yeah. I've, I've shot like four or five scenes with Mike. Mike's actually one of the few guys in Toronto that's genuinely about porn life. Like, right. Like he really, um, uh, like for lack of a better parallel i'd say he's like a i want to be like a hugh hefner kind of dude right and i'd say that mike's more of like a, a larry flint kind of a dude right 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 and like i i actually want to like you know some of the liberation and some of the racial boundaries that playboy broke down like i have those dreams as far as what i want to do for toronto and canadian right. culture and and the world but like um mike as a videographer he's really got some good ethical standards yeah. and morals and and um, he's not into the old schools, like the old way of filming in the eighties is like, like, um, Seika and Nina Hartley and John Holmes and stuff. They'd all be directed. Like right. the director's like, yo, I want you to fuck her in these three positions in these right. rooms. And then, and then, uh, and then I want it done. And that's the end of my movie. And then the actors didn't have really any control over what happened. They were just like, we're just going to pay you to fuck and you do what we say. Right. But like. X, I don't even know what a percentage is, but like certain porn directors still do it like that. And yeah. especially in, in Cali, it's a lot of dudes are like, yo, I got the camera, I got the location, maybe I got the girl. If you want to get paid to fuck, you fuck the way I tell you to fuck. And then I give you your money and then you go and enjoy your fame and fortune. And if you don't want to do that, fine, I'll get somebody else. But like w the new model, which some people in... Um, San Francisco and some of the indie and some of the lesbian, right. queer, uh, gay. Well, not even gay, but like the queer, just queer community. Um, they're just like improv porn, romance porn, natural right. porn, real porn, real right. people doing real things. Like maybe or maybe not you get a cum shot. Maybe or maybe not you get squirting. Like it's it's just genuine people doing genuine things in real real yeah i mean the the philosophy behind what he's doing at the club it sounds like you have a concept an idea we could make it happen the way that you envision it yep instead of like this you know top bottom approach you know like well as you were saying right we'll direct you we'll yeah. tell the actors what to do this is what sells it's kind of like you want to realize your artistic creative vision we can help that and do it ethically which i mean like this interview alone right like um you know there's testament to it that there's so many things that you do you're a journalist you're an actor you're a musician you're um trying to change the, the porn industry so in some ways like this kind of visionary like what kind of legacy do you want to leave um one of my favorite people that i like to parallel myself to is casanova uh casanova was not only was he a genuine lover of women um but he was also a spy he was a mathematician he was a linguist um I think it was one of the kings, either the king of England or the king of France, had said that Casanova was the most civilized man on the planet in his time. Wow. Was the most advanced thinker. Most people think, oh, Casanova, you know, he slept with a lot of women. He didn't sleep with a lot of women. He actually slept with 132 women, which 
isn't actually that much, but um, as far as like famous people go, um, but the thing about Casanova is that he loved, he notoriously loved each woman and was like not about Don Juan. I think is a, one of the myths around sexuality, or maybe even Wilt Chamberlain or or Mick Jagger. Some of these guys are like they're just trying to rack up numbers and just right. be like, yeah, I, I fucked a million girls and like. I don't even remember a single one of their names, but my dick's been in a million different cool places. And it's like, I'm not about that. I'm about the Casanova approach where like I genuinely appreciate and respect and cherish each sexual experience I have and each woman that I'm with. And I want every woman that I'm with to remember the story. I want every song I write about it to be eternal and classic. And I want every porn that I make to have genuine, real, beautiful passion in it. And um, I genuinely, I want to be a living, breathing example of healthy, fearless, revolutionary sexuality. That's one thing I am doing for the rest of my life. I've told my family, I've told my friends, like, like you said, as far as hiding, I don't hide shit from no one. You can ask me anything about anything. I'm like, I don't care. I, I like to be truthful. So, and I'm fearless. So like, I'm not gonna, I don't got shit to hide. Like, um, so like the legacy I want to leave is um more actually about being a mix of Rumi and Jesus and Malcolm X and and Batman. <laughs> That's probably like yeah, you know, like I do, you know, there's a part of me that my sexuality and my love it's it feels good and I love to make love and I love women, but I also love the art form of it and I love the songs and dancing and drawings and the naked female body and all the art and sex and conversations that come from connections between men and women and people and people but i also love fighting for justice and and actually really doing the justice work and intellectual work that it takes to spread it all that joy around sexuality to more people because sometimes i'm like i focus i'm like people are like how are you doing i'm like I am fucking amazing. I I have a whole bunch of lovers. I sometimes get paid to fuck. I have a, a lot of rap privilege and whatever. But, like, I want more people to experience the bliss that I feel. Like, if somebody wants to know, like, what it takes to have ten different girlfriends or lovers. I don't even call them girlfriends. They're my lovers. But, like, I have twice as many lovers as Charlie Sheen had when he was at the height of his Tiger Blood <laughs> fame. So, I'm like... Yo, I could teach some of these dudes. Like, I love Drake and stuff, but I hear Drake's lyrics sometimes, and I'm like, dude, sit down with me. Let me tell you about a higher level of relationship. Mm. Like, you don't have to have these trust issues with these girls. and <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to be checking their phone when you go to the washroom. Like, I, I, you could teach me how to earn money better, and I could teach you how to make love better. Like, this could be a good relationship, Drake. Holler at the boy. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but like, for real, but also joking, but also for yeah. real. <laughs> but like, yeah, genuinely, I just want to teach people how to love better. Um, be I, it's it's also fast. You know, actually, I do have a question for you because I I make short films in my spare time. Cool. And um, I did a film not too long ago where I had to do like a simulated sex scene. Wow. And uh, I was talking to the actor, and um, I was like, you know, I make sure you're comfortable and stuff like that, you know, and like, you know, try, try not to get a heart on because I'll, I'll make the actress uncomfortable. And he was like, you know what? You don't even have to say that because there's no way that I would be able to get a boner with like four cameramen around me. <laughs> and I was thinking that, that might be something. Is that something that you can cons like consider? Is that something that factors in at all? Or you just block it out when you're doing porn? Like that there's a, there's a whole elaborate crew around you, you know, making this film. You asked the most important thing. Like, any guy, any guy who wants to get into this, first thing I'll tell you, this is what I believe is the key. It's focus. And, you know, when we're naked, we're generally highly sensitive. And it would be difficult to focus on one individual thing when there's so many variables that you're concerned about when you're in such a state of vulnerability. Um, a guy's like, shit, I'm naked and my dick is out and I'm aroused maybe and I don't want people to see what kind of a person I am when I want to satisfy this girl or I don't want them to see my dick or my balls or my ass or my, my stomach or whatever. And 
And that's the reason why most guys probably can't do porn because if you're in a room and there's three cameras around you and three dudes operating a camera, you're actually not thinking about the naked woman and the pussy and the tits in front of you. You're like looking all over the place and you're like, I wonder what that camera angle looks like and what the fuck does that guy think about my dick and what the fuck is that guy get that camera away from my ass and it's like, dude, you're supposed to be fucking and you can't fuck if you're not thinking about pussy. <laughs> so like that's it, it it takes superhuman focus um and when i am shooting like somebody could be getting caught to death with an axe four feet away from me and i won't really notice i don't want to notice and if it'll take me out of the pleasure of making porn if if my focus can be broken and i'm, I'm not going to say that i'm perfect at it i the last sh scene I shot, it took me a lot longer to get my focus where it needs to be um, than usual. Cause I, you can have an off day, chemistry with your co-star, that can always throw things off. Fucking in a weird location, um, new director, bad meal, anything could throw off your body. And you're like, you know, you, you want to have a certain level of awareness of yourself. You're like, I feel good. I feel like I can go fuck. And like... But then you get on set and you're like, oh, shit, I got a stomach ache or like or like you have a conversation with her and you're like, what the fuck is in her head? I, I'm not vibing with this girl right now. Too, too tough. And and then director's like, all right, time to shoot. Cameras turn on and you're like, oh, God, I'm freezing up. Well, well like, I'm not freezing up. But my dick is out to lunch and the rest of us are here trying to make a meal. <laughs> and so, yeah, it takes a lot of focus. Um I've had times where I've had three cameramen around. I shot a scene. I shot a trans scene. I've never actually been with a trans person before, but I was like, fuck it. I'm going to get an amazing experience with a very amazing human being. This trans woman was one of the smartest person that I've ever fucking talked to in my life. Um, but we shot it at the Gladstone Hotel with a porn company from los angeles and a tv host from chicago and three different cameras three different middle-aged white fat men <laughs> holding the cameras and a trans woman in a place i've never fucked before and i was like no the money is one thing but like fuck this is a learning curve this is a steep 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 learning curve but I was like, I'm throwing myself into this. Fuck it. And uh, and I did it. It was great. And uh, it wasn't it wasn't easy. There was moments where my body was reacting with me and responding positively. And then there were moments where I was like, yo, dick, what the fuck? I need you to do better. Come on, man. What the fuck? And uh, so it's it's constantly porn constantly evolves your mind. Like people, some of the smartest people I've ever, ever, ever encountered with. Uh, I come across with in life are people in porn and I that's the last thing I want to put in my legacy yeah. to kill this fucking stigma that porn stars or sexual people are stupid like that's one of the dumbest fucking fallacies of human life like oh they're porn stars they work with their bodies so they can't be smart like are you joking they've just chosen to get paid for doing something awesome and the only real price for most women is the social stigma and of being ostracized. But if you have friends and family that are supportive, then you're getting paid to do what a lot of people feel is the best activity in life. So how fucking stupid are they? <laughs> Not that stupid. So, like, I really, like, I want to put out a lot of books and writing and a lot right. of stuff around, like, yeah, I, yeah, I am a porn star. And, yeah, some people were, some people, somebody asked me once, somebody's like, Yo, Mindbender, you're like a hip-hop mayor. How the fuck are you going to throw away 20 years of your fucking legacy and your and your your hard work in, like, just to do porn? I'm like, throw it away? What are you fucking... I feel like that shit was, like, that was an audition for my real career. Like, <laughs> like this is my real dream now. Hip-hop was, like, the dream for children. Porn is the dream for fucking super dreamers, man. Like... <laughs> I'm like, no way. I didn't throw away shit. So like, yeah. and like, it's all, it also, also has a thing about performance right. and 
whether you're an athlete, but definitely being an actor or a musician or a porn star, there's a very big thing about performance right. and focus and living in the moment. Like, porn helps me really appreciate life. Like, not yeah, I get to have, get paid to fuck beautiful women, but like, you get to cherish life. I don't like being high or drunk when I'm on set. I'm like, yo, I want to remember every microscopic molecule of me being asked to fuck this beautiful woman. <laughs> like, I don't want to. There's so many ways that porn can still go, you know, because it's like the same narrative over and over again. Most of it, you know what I mean? Yes. It's just on repeat, on repeat. Like, imagine trying to sell that to, like, mainstream movies or movie people. Like, we're just going to get the guy to go in and do this. And then the second time it comes around, we'll just same thing. I'm, like, you can't think of any other genre where the plot is just the same thing, but people still... Except Gr yeah, gravitate. So that's why there's so much room. Like maybe that's what's happening, especially with the female friendly porn and the feminist porn awards. All this stuff. It's opening up the gates for like different conceptions and reconceptions of what pornography can be about. You nailed it, man. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I'm. That's what I'm here to do, yeah. man. Like, here's I want to do a lot of cross, parallel pollinating and breeding yeah. and inter incestual hip-hop porn right. like i i want to like do my own porn scene and then have like a mind bender i actually have my my um porn hub scene is like the very first taste of like mind bender mixing with malcolm lovejoy because it's it's me doing a porn scene at oasis my, uh, malcolm lovejoy doing porn but the soundtrack is a Mindbender song from Beautiful Mutant. So, oh, okay, so okay, I'm nice. doing this. <laughs> nice. So the, the funky bomb chicken wow, wow music is my own music. <laughs> so, oh, so, nice. so, so your universe. It's my whole universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, yes. And I don't like, I actually, that's the very last thing I should say. I, um, there's been a few, like, I make this statement tentatively, but I also think it's true. I, think i'm one of the only if not the only actual hip-hop porn star on the planet like as far as functional fucking rapping porn star i say professional love maker but uh, nice. hip-hop professional love maker so that's mindbender supreme aka malcolm lovejoy aka adam e. stewart and mindbender loves you for listening wow what a fascinating individual absolutely you know, it's uh, for me, I know Mindbender and I see it as an extension, what he's doing now in porn as an extension of his creative side. But I'm really interested in knowing like how this is going to pan out in the hip hop community. Um, I kind of get the sense that from what he's seen so far, the response has been lukewarm, which I kind of find is ironic because porn, I mean, to be a porn star in hip hop when you hear the lyrics and whatnot is a good thing. But insofar as he's a porn star and people respond to that, people are kind of like, well, I'm not so sure what to think about it. It's almost like <laughs> maybe it's the thing about Toronto is the hip hop community more conservative than one might think. I'm not sure. I mean, what, what do you think? Well, it's fascinating because, I mean, technically speaking, you're right. I mean, your, your cred level would probably go up if you're right, a porn right. star in the exactly. hip hop community. However, I think it also does depend on who and what exactly you're putting your penis into right, right. that's the thing because it, they don't like it. they don't like the guy on guy stuff which is funny because like mindbender was say I, mean, I don't think he actually cares about what the hip-hop community thinks about his. i don't think so i don't think so at all i mean and i mean the kind of porn that he's doing is a kind of um it's a break from the the way that women are viewed right and in popular hip hop, he is the the goddess worshiper, right? That's his mission. He's on this mission to put women's pleasure before his own, which is not the thing that you hear a lot about in, in normal hip hop or in popular hip hop. Uh, you know, as you don't really see in in mainstream porn. So he's on this sort of this mission to right also change. I think the way that um, porn is done. And he wants to be sort of the maybe a trailblazer in that way of, of you know putting putting women's pleasure always before his own and uh, making that sexy. I feel there's a lot of him in his porn. He's not just like an actor. He is in um, the moment. He is 
almost like the director which is something i wish i had asked him a little bit more about about how much creative control he has in these porns that he's doing because so much of what he wants to do is a personal mission you know um absolutely you know <clears throat> i gotta ask you paul yeah. i mean sitting with mindbender this whole time and him talking about how he's a porn star and all this stuff on sets and whatnot yeah i mean like i, I feel like i have to watch one of his porns <laughs> yeah do you feel that too? I mean, like, exactly. I don't know that I want to necessarily, but I feel like I have to. Yeah, like, where, the, the end, when is the first porn production coming out? You know, is it going to be on, like, a DVD? Can is we it... pre order it? <laughs> That's right. Like, the special edition with Mindbender's commentary track? Well, you know, like, on his page, you can see, like, clips, you know, clips of stuff he's done. Um, under, like, his porn name is Malcolm Lovejoy. So, on his page, you can see that. Um, along with his other hip-hop stuff but it, insofar as like a full-length feature porn production that is something i'm sure he's involved with but yeah when that's coming out i i don't know well we'll eagerly be looking into that so right, let right. all of our listeners know yeah as soon as that comes out so yeah that that is another thing i guess so malcolm lovejoy that is you know mindbender supreme is one name he had. that is his hip-hop I don't want to say persona, but that's the name he goes under when he's doing hip hop and when he's performing as a porn star, he is Malcolm Lovejoy. So you could look up those two names depending on what part of his life you're interested in. That's right. We'll probably only be posting links to one of those, though. Right. The Lovejoy one. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I wonder how Drake would comment on that now, you know, because at the time, I don't think he was doing porn when Drake called him. The, um, the most caring hip hop fan in Canada. So I'd be interested in knowing now what, what Drake would call him now, whether it be something like the most caring hip hop fan porn star in the country or what it'd be. But um, it was Mindbender that he was commenting on. But now this is like a new journey, you know. This is a new journey for Mindbender. This is where we're at the cusp, really, of his. his uh, of his journey as a pioneer. Yeah, into the porn. Yeah, world of porn. Yeah. That. Yeah. But definitely, as I see the passion there. Him as a hip-hop artist, as being as strong as it is in hip-hop. Whether he's doing porn or hip-hop, is definitely, he puts everything. And if you want to see more of that passion, Google search Malcolm Lovejoy. That's right. <laughs> Plenty for of sure. passion for everyone. For sure. For sure. So next podcast, we're interviewing Christian Picciolini who's a reformed neo-Nazi. Reformed? Once a Nazi, always a Nazi in my book. Well, actually, he's turned a new leaf, and now he's a peace advocate. Turned a new leaf. More likely, he just turned a page in Mein Kampf. Well, we'll see. Until then. This is The Dark Room.